The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today in the studio we have a very special guest. Uh, he is a floral designer, also the director of the Ben School of Floral Design, and a senior lecturer. His name is Bill McKinley, and we have a great conversation about uh, his artistic process and how he creates these floral designs and uh, all the different styles that there are for different design uh, designs. I didn't even know there was different styles, so um, apparently there's full classes on this. So yeah, we have a great conversation and very enlightening. Um, and then for the second part of my uh, interview, we will be revisiting my interview with Lisa Urban. Uh, we actually did this interview back in July, and she is a 3D fiber sculpture, also an oil painter, and an abstract figurative drawer. She does it all. Uh, she's also an art teacher at St. Joseph's Catholic School for middle and high school level. And yeah, we have a great conversation about how paper mache actually inspired her artwork. So yeah, keep tuning in to find out about that. Uh, and for our announcements, uh, we are actually having the Samara Joy ticket giveaway today. So if you are listening, make sure to go to tx.ag slash THOA giveaway. That's THOA for the heart of art. So yeah, it's a very easy link. Go to tx.ag slash THOA giveaway. And uh, we will be giving away two pairs of tickets. So four lucky people will get some free tickets. Um, we actually recently had Elena Reese here uh, from Friends of Chamber Music. And she was very generous to give us two, t two pairs of tickets. So yeah, make sure if, if you want to enjoy uh, this concert, uh, this jazz singing concert, uh, Samara is amazing. I definitely uh, recommend that you go to this link and try and get those tickets. And once again, the link is tx.ag slash THOA giveaway. All right, let's start the show. Hello and good evening everyone. Welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today in the studios we have a very special guest. He is a director of Ben's School of Floral Design and is currently an instructional associate professor under the De Department of Horticulture Studies. He is a member of the American Institute of Floral Designers or AIFD and his name is Bill McKinley. So hi Bill, how are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. That's awesome because I am so excited to have you here. Um, I actually had never heard of floor design being an option or uh, for, you know, a university studies. So, um, yeah, like it was the first time when I came here to A and M that I actually knew that it was something that people could go into. Uh, why do you think that is that not a lot of people know about it? Well, it's not that common. Actually, there are not a lot of uh, universities that have floral design as a either a degree or a minor or even certificate. The, the uniqueness of the Benz School is that Buddy Benz, who was the originator of the school, who had his school was in Houston, was a 1932 graduate of Texas A&M. And when he uh, set up his estate and uh, he had no heirs, so he bequeathed his whole entire estate to Texas A&M, establishing the Benz School here at Texas A&M. Wow, that's a great story. <laughs> We're lucky to have him then. <laughs> um, well, I like to go into the stories of, of the artists that come to on the show, so I'd like to ask you, um, where are you from, and has nature always been a part of your life? Oh, yes, nature's always been a part of my life. I grew up on a farm in southern Missouri, and uh, but I knew pretty quickly that I didn't want to be a farmer, so mm -hmm. to speak, but I loved plants gardening, that sort of uh, um, avenue into the outdoors and nature. So uh, I didn't even know what the word horticulture meant until I was in high school and doing a little research on where to go and what to do in uh, college. So that's when I discovered horticulture. 
and um, went to the University of Missouri in Columbia and actually uh, focused on greenhouse production for three years. I had to uh, take a floral design course as part of that curriculum, and then it's like, hmm, well, no, I should have been <laughs> in a different area here. Okay. But I finished the degree and then came to Texas A&M for my graduate studies in um, retail floristry and floral design. Mm-hmm. Yes, I saw that. Uh, is, is that what the MAG means? Is, does it mean Master's in Agriculture? Yes. Okay, okay. And it's floriculture, right? What does that exactly mean? Well, floriculture is the study of floral materials. Okay. okay. Uh, whether it be greens, flowers themselves, or something like that. And floral material, is that specifically like um, like the reproductive organ that you focus on? No. Floriculture is, is in its broadest sense, anything used in floral. Okay. So it could be the, the growing of the plants in a greenhouse. It could be the harvesting. It could be transportation, any of that. Okay, any of it. Okay. What was it about farming that you didn't like? <laughs> <laughs> the, the unpredictability. Mm, yes. <laughs> You're at the mercy of, of the weather, and, mm. you know, if the tractor breaks down or the combine doesn't work or whatever, that just didn't appeal to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually did have a question planned about... Um, about the supply and demand within like uh, floral design, like do you have to have a certain flower at a certain amount of, at, of time during the year? Maybe it might not be available for you, or is there always supply for any design that you would want to make? I Mostly, yes. Uh, though COVID has put a little kink in all of the supply chain. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the world is small now because um, anything that we grow here seasonally is also opposite season in the southern hemisphere so uh, a large percentage of our flowers foliages and things come from south america or australia in the southern hemisphere so if we need tulips in july well we can get them because they're growing someplace else in the world at that time okay so you all you can always get them at any time just depends where you get them right and the price too you know right Uh, it's going to be more expensive because of the shipping and that is uh, definitely becoming more and more of an issue. Yeah, that's a very big factor. Um, I was wondering what your first experience in creating a floral piece was like. First experience? Oh, wow. That is a hmm, thought-provoking, evocative (laughs) question. Um, I guess I don't remember specifically. I just remember... Uh, having t- to take the course that I really didn't want to take, hmm. uh, and then using the flowers um, in their raw form and putting them together, designing with them to make something even prettier than what an individual flower looks like. Mm-hmm. And I think that's sort of the essence of of what floral design is all about, is knowing how to put the the flowers aesthetically pleasingly together knowing how they actually grow yes um yeah i was actually wondering whether you did you had any other aptitudes in other arts because i would imagine that it does take a good eye to be a good floral designer you know well um yes and no i'm i'm certainly not a professional in it but uh uh i dabble in uh, woodworking and you know the whole art of uh, identifying grain and and the be- you know the absolute beauty of certain woods and how you can make a spectacular piece of furniture out of what was a stick you know in the yard at some point so um i do some uh landscape design minimal uh, mostly on a personal and family sort of a basis mm-hmm. um i just dabble in all kinds of art actually all right awesome yeah, I feel like most people that do, you know, have a, a certain aptitude towards creativity tend to dabble in, in plenty of things. So it makes sense. Uh, are there like different styles for floral design? Like how what would a, a classroom speaking about floral design look like? Are there different styles that you teach? Oh, yeah, there's there's many, many, many different kinds mm-hmm. and styles of design. Uh, it depends on the, the course. Uh, on which style we tend to focus on. But uh, normally we start with sort of the basic 
uh, traditional uh, geometric forms, you know, round, triangles, uh, horizontals. Those, those are sort of the bread and butter of, of retail floristry. Mm -hmm. And then we graduate up into more of what we would consider floral art. Um, those would be design styles that are not necessarily commercial, but they're uh, aesthetically pleasing, one-of-a-kind pieces that um, they could be small for a table or they could be huge installation pieces that, you know, would go in an atrium or a, um, a large venue of some sort. So yeah, there's, there's a style, there's a, a, a type of floral design for everybody. Right. You know, from vegetative, very naturalistic, to very high style, um, clean and neat, um, minimalistic might be another word for it. So, yeah, there's all kinds. Hmm. And what are some of your favorite plants to work with? Oh, my. My students ask me all the time, Mr. McKinley, what is your favorite flower? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, well, it depends on the day of the week because there are so many beautiful flowers um, and so many wonderful materials to work with. Um, so I think I'm not going to answer that question. There's, there's no answer. There is really it. not an answer. <laughs> right. There's just so many. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there's so much variety in plants. I feel like the world is your oyster, but it has a whole other meaning because the world has literally <laughs> so many different types of plants. Um, what would you say your artistic process is like? Where do you start, and then how do you get to your final destination? Well, it sort of depends on the project. Uh, sometimes, uh, actually, I have some uh, presentations I do on let, letting your container speak to you, because if you have a container a client or somebody brings to you, th there are certain things or styles that will go with that container, so you try to, to work with that. Um, other times, you know, the sky's the limit, and that's when you really just draw on some experiences and some uh, past um, possibly uh, other instances where you might have seen something, you know, mm -hmm. that you can pull together. You know, in my mind... Um, Probably, before you even start putting a design together, you need to have about 70, 75 percent of it visualized in your brain. And that way, you know where you're going. And then that last 25 percent is, oh, well, you know, that's not working so well. So you do a little switch or a flexibility uh, aspect in there. But if you start with nothing, it takes so long in the process because you're constantly changing and pulling and and uh, it's just not a good idea to start with a blank slate and you need to have that vision in your head that's right. really what makes an end product look good so a general idea yeah is the best way to go um what are you know being member of like a, a, a national uh, organization of floral designers, um, I bet you have maybe traveled some places. Do you have any experiences of like traveling for floral design? Uh, yeah, pretty extensively. Mm -hmm. um, all over the country, you know, I've done programs and and uh, presentations. Uh, a lot more in Texas, but also California, Florida. All over the U.S., the Ben School also has a satellite program in uh, South Korea. So I travel there uh, twice a year, uh, exempting COVID years. Right. Uh, but um, they, I go there. It's a, tra a, a train the trainer program. So I go there and evaluate students as well as the the teachers that I have taught to make sure you know everything's still on par and up to the quality that the Ben School is uh, is about. Awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you for, for that service that you do for providing that. Um, I actually wanted to ask, and, and you know, here at KMU, we have a, a show called Garden Success that airs Thursdays at 12. Um, I wanted to know whether you knew Skip Brichter. <laughs> uh, I, I do know Skip. Okay. I don't know him as in going out for, you know, dinner or anything like <laughs> that. But but being in the extension, yes, we're, we have met 
several times passing okay. in the hall. Awesome. And what is the extension that you refer to? Uh, the, the, the Horticulture Extension Service. Okay, awesome. All right. Um, do you have any important dates coming up that you would like our audience to know about? Or, I don't know, any, any events? Well, um, we do. I'm also the advisor to our floral club here on campus, and we do a lot of the campus of events oh. uh, here on campus. Uh, and football weekend is coming, the first one. Right. So uh, that's when a lot of people have functions and events. So yes, we have. Oh my, two or three events uh, leading up to football weekend, and then uh, we're also in charge of the. Uh, floral decor for some of the suites over at Kyle Field. So we'll be doing that and installing those. It's a good experience for the students to see the behind the scenes. You know, it's not just all in the classroom. Um, I'm constantly taking them to the venues. Okay, now this is the back hall. This is the kitchen over here, but we're not going to the kitchen. (laughs) You know, so it's all interconnected and, and the whole collaboration process with with uh, the catering and the linens and the venue, that's all an important learning experience for the students. Mm -hmm. So yes, we specifically, um, I'm not sure that I should be mentioning all of the names, but there are a lot of events coming up, yes. Okay, awesome. Um, Does the student organization that you speak of um, take commission from people or is it mostly for A&M events that you all create? No, I limit it to only A and M events. Okay, uh, I, I don't want to appear to be um, competing with local uh, entrepreneurs and businesses, so only A and M functions. All right, and you yourself, do you still design? Oh, all the time. Really? Every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Actually, when just before I came, I'm prepping for a couple of the events that are coming up. So. I do sample designs, and then students work on uh, duplicating those. And um, so, yeah, designing all the time. Great. And is there a place that people can go and I know, you know, um, these pieces that you make aren't going to last forever, so I, I bet you'll take a lot of pictures of them. Is there anywhere people can go and see, like, your your designs? Uh, well, the best place to go would be the Ben School Facebook page. Okay. Um, oh, dear. Uh, I don't know that specific address off the top of my head. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you go to uh, the Department of Horticulture and then there's a tab for uh, the Ben School, just click on that and there's a Facebook uh, right. link in there. Mm-hmm. And that's you, you are correct. We uh, try to take pictures of most of the events we do as well as our classes. And, uh, you know, there's probably 10 years worth of wow. <laughs> images on there if you want to go look at them. Yeah, and a lot of inspiration for people too. That's great. Um, is there anything about the art of floral design that you want our audience to know but that you don't think we have mentioned yet? Um, well, you know, uh, floral design is kind of a unique animal in the art world. Uh, it's, it's so temporary mm-hmm. uh, compared to, you know, architecture. Hopefully it's not temporary. <laughs> uh, and paintings as well. Right. The, but, you know, that's part of the, the draw to it, is that it is beauty, and then it's gone. You know, mm-hmm. so it's, it's not a permanent uh, thing. I, I think the one thing I might also mention is that uh, what I have found over the years to be advantageous for a floral designer is knowing how the flower actually works you know, um, biologically or physiologically, what happens inside that flower. So if it doesn't last, well, okay, now we need to analyze why. What is it that's not working? But it also helps you understand the use of it in a design. Upside down, unless you're doing abstract work, that's not a good idea. Right. And uh, that's an obvious uh, example, but the same thing applies to a lot of design. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like floral design's a blending of the art, humanities, the sciences, and it all kind of amalgamates together into this, um, hopefully, aesthetically pleasing enhancement to your environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because 
I mean, I think we take it for granted sometimes because it's all around us, um, whether it be at a funeral or at a football game, you know, it's, it's everywhere. So um, thank you so much for stopping by and enlightening us a little bit on it. Glad to. Thank you for asking. Of course. Anytime. <laughs> All right, you guys, we will be going on a quick break, but do not go anywhere. We will be right back. Support for KAMU is provided by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts, presenting once-in-a-generation jazz vocalist Samara Joy on Thursday, September 29th at 7 p.m. in Rudder Theater, co-sponsored by Friends of Chamber Music and the Brazos Valley Jazz Society. More information at academyarts.tamu.edu. Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the KMU Studios. Now we will be revisiting my interview with Lisa Urban, who is a 3D fiber sculptor and oil painter. So hi, Lisa. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Great to be here. Awesome. I'm excited for a conversation today because you do a lot of art. You have a lot of content to go over. So I'm really excited to talk about it. Yeah, I, I, I'm all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes. Um, so where did your art, love for art begin? Oh man, I think I've been making art my whole life, honestly. I had really good teachers in elementary, middle, and high school, and they just really pushed me and gave me the, what I needed to, to pursue it further after, after school, you know. Where was this? This was back in Kansas. Kansas. Um, I actually okay. grew up in Kansas, and I moved here right after college, so, oh. um, Yeah. And what was the reason for moving to here? Was it here in Bryan where you it moved was, to? It's sort of. I graduated from Kansas State in the fall of 2013. And so I applied for a residency in Navasota through the Arts Council of the Brazos Valley. Awesome. And I got it. I was one of three artists who moved down in the fall of 2014 to do this artist residency at the historic Horlock House in Navasota. Wow. Um, the residency is actually still going on today. It's been going on for about eight or nine years now. Nice. And congratulations I did that. for that, by the way. Yeah, it was it was great. It was a really good experience, especially for me being right out of college and not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. um, I did that. It was supposed to be six months. I ended up staying for a whole year because hmm. um, I really liked the area. I told the Arts Council I kind of wanted to stick around. So they awesome. offered me an extra six months. And then after that, I had fallen in love with Bryan College Station to the point where I just decided to move here and make this my home. Right. Most people do fall in love with the area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are your, some of your like earliest memories of art? What were some of the things that you were interested in as, as a little girl? Uh, well, coloring books were huge. I had, mm. you know, grandma who always gave me coloring books and markers and crayons and just things like that. But even then, I remember I remember some very specific projects, even from elementary school of just like doing watercolor with abstract lines. And like we did a Van Gogh sunflower one year and just all kinds of just things like that that just I've because I love art so much, it's just stuck with me even mm. to this day. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to go straight into art, the art, uh, specifically in, in your case, because I think that your memories are really tied into your art, and that's mm -hmm. something that I've seen along with your Illuminid series. When did you start connecting knitting with your memories? Uh, probably in, like, 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. So... The sculpture that you saw at the MSC is kind of related to memory, and I've done other sculptures that are also related to memory, but it actually started with my paintings. So mm -hmm. since about 2017, my paintings have been more like waterscapes with the forms floating in them, and there's always one that's glowing. And mm -hmm. I always tell people, or I relate it somehow to saying that that glowing form is like your most prominent memory. It's the one that sticks in your brain, something you remember. And then there's usually some other forms in there that are starting to fall back. They've got lots of layers of paint over them. You can't really see them. And those I always kind of relate to, like, the ones that are kind of falling from your memory. You, they're fuzzy. You, they're there, but you just don't remember them. Mm -hmm. um, and right. so that's kind of, like, when the whole memory idea came into play. Awesome. And is creating this cathartic for you in a way? Or what, what does it do to you? It, it's very – well, painting in general is very cathartic. It's mm -hmm. a good – it's a good way for me to relax, but so is knitting. And that's even when I was before I was doing like the waterscapes with the memory related. I always said that like knitting was magical. Knitting was a way for me to escape, to get away from the pains of everyday life. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a hard childhood, but there were a lot of times when I just wanted to like escape. And so 
I would watch Disney movies. I would watch cartoons. I would do things like that. And so then when I learned how to knit in college, I kind of did the same thing. It was a way for me to escape, just Mm. sit down, let my brain just kind of relax and not really think about anything except what I was making. Right. Um, I know. Well, I kind of wanted to tie that into there was this piece where each I think um, you chose a month of October and each day was like a different memory. Each knot not was like a different memory yeah. of like each day. Um, and then seeing that as like a whole piece together of, of like a, a consumption of time, you know, put together. Um, is that a way of you of like reflecting on your past, you know, once it's yeah. finished? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm really glad you brought that one up. Um, I need to go back to that because I haven't done it in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that piece was in 2019. But the idea was that I wanted a way to make these globes that represented me and like my time and like my memories or my physical experience of the day. So, yeah, I was doing this big ball and I did it for I did one ball to represent a week. And each day of that week, I did a different stitch pattern, depending on if my day had been easy or hard. And as a teacher, you just never know how your day is going to be. Right. Um, So that was a really fun. And then I think I did. Yeah. For the whole month of October, I did like five different globes that represented the month of October yeah I love that that was a great way of you know physically seeing time it was amazing um between painting and knitting how do you divide your time between the two it kind of depends um right now I'm doing a whole lot more knitting than I am painting (laughs) Mm -hmm. um but sometimes like I'm just I haven't been feeling it lately I don't know what's going on but um other times I would really just rather be in the studio painting I I think like when we went into quarantine for COVID, I had this opportunity. I could have knocked out a million paintings and I knocked out one. Right. But then like in 2021, I was working towards a solo show with all my paintings. And so I knocked out like 10. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's very, it's just, it, it comes and goes. Right. It's but, random. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever inspiration comes, yeah. you can't force it. Yeah. Yes. Um, what is uh, your artistic bro- process like? Does it begin with a memory like you did in that? Or how, do, how, how does that go? Um, for my paintings, it usually actually begins more with like a color scheme or some kind of like sketch or landscape layout. Uh, a lot of my paintings, like I said before, are kind of inspired by like animation or Disney or like things that from my childhood. So I'll often um, kind of use that as the basis of the inspiration. And then also I actually set up a still life in my studio um on the floor at this point because I'm looking down it's for the waterscape and it's usually like the glowing ball with a light bulb underneath it and then other balls and plastic wrap and colored papers and that's kind of like the basis that I start my paintings from and then once I get a couple layers on the canvas I I kind of stop looking at it and just do what I feel is right Hmm. um in terms of the sculpture pieces I definitely would you know I kind of had to start with the the memory or the what had happened that day to give me an idea of what stitches I was going to make or what pattern I was going to use. Mm -hmm. And how do you make it stiff or harden? Oh yeah. (laughs) So that's an interesting question. And I actually, this is one of those moments when like teaching has informed my art because the whole idea came about when I was doing a paper mache project with my students. Uh, Um, I, we were just doing it and I was like, I could totally do this with my knitting. So I make the, I make the form. I blow up a balloon inside of it once I'm completely done. I dip it in watered down glue. I let it dry. And then when I'm done, I just pop the balloon. Wow. Awesome. (laughs) And if people want to have, you know, this is radio, so they can't really see it. If they do want to have a visual representation of it, do you have a website where they can go and check out your work? I do. Um, My website is just Lisa Urban, and that's Mm U-R-B-A-N art.com. All right, you guys, that is the end of our show. Thank you so much for tuning in. And a big thank you to Bill McKinley and Lisa Urban for being a part of this project. And once again, if you missed that link at the beginning of the show, uh, the link to snatch those Samara Joy tickets is tx.ag slash THOA giveaway. All right, have a great day and make sure to tune in next week. I'm Hector Nino and you've been listening to The Heart of Art, a production of 90.9 KAMU-FM. You can find all of our shows anytime at kamu.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. 
The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts.